Speaking of heroes and heroism, we had the opportunity, this was on Friday, to go out to Oxford. There's a couple of master seminary men there who are studying, Harold Gandhi and Alberto Solano. And it was just an amazing experience for me to get to tour a little bit of Oxford because of the rich church history that is there. And to hear about William Tyndale studying there and then to see even the place where the Oxford martyrs were burned at the stake, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley and Thomas Cranmer. And we know about the White Horse Tavern there, the pub where they would meet and they would talk about Reformation ideas. And that included men like John Rogers who was burned at the stake not far from here because he was so faithful in translating the Bible into English. And then you, you hear even a little bit later in church history about the committee there at Oxford who along with a committee at Cambridge and a committee at Westminster helped produce the King James translation of the Bible. And a little bit later, the Holy Club made up of men like George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley called the Holy Club actually because they weren't saved at the time. They thought they could earn God's pleasure by being good externally and God saved them out of that external righteousness and helped them see the true beauty of the gospel. But as I was there and even as I've been here in London, just so much history here, I've been reminded that we are part of this long line of godly men and women who have as Hebrews 12.1 says, provided for us a great cloud of witnesses so that as we follow in their train, we look past them and we fix our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of the faith. Well, if there's one thing that all of the great pastors, like Charles Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones and all of the great theologians and church leaders of church history, if there's one thing that they have in common, it is this, in terms of their perspective, that they all longed for the glorified perfection that awaits every believer in the presence of Christ in heaven. They all had a heavenly mindset, a heavenly perspective. It's the reason they were willing to endure great affliction for the sake of that which awaited them on the other side of death. And that's our theme for this morning, the theme of heaven, thinking about life from a heavenly perspective. Our theme for this morning is the life to come. For those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of heaven is not a fantasy. It is our future reality. And to quote from another famous Oxford scholar, don't always agree with everything he said, but I like this, C.S. Lewis, he said, the Christians who have done the most for this present world are precisely those who think most of the next. It is only since Christians have begun thinking less of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. The Christians who do the most for this present world are precisely those who think the most about the world to come. I think that's a compelling statement and I think he's right. And in light of that, we as believers, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, ought to occupy our hearts and minds with the truth about heaven so that we might live today in light of tomorrow. We might be faithful in light of our fixed hope. The reality, of course, is that there are times when we can lose sight of our heavenly home, when we can become distracted, when we take our eyes off of those things that really matter. 
I think there can be reasons for that. Sometimes it's that we get caught up in the entanglements of this world. We get distracted with the things of the everyday, the tyranny of the urgent. We become spiritually nearsighted and we stop seeing things from a proper perspective. There are certainly times even when we give in to temptation and we exchange the glory of heaven and the hope that we have for the passing pleasures of this life, things that 1 John 2 says are passing away. And when we allow those things to become our focus, the picture of Christ and the picture of heaven becomes blocked in our view. But I do believe that there is another reason why sometimes believers lose sight of heaven, and it's because sometimes our picture of heaven leaves a lot to be desired. Sometimes the picture we have of heaven is something far less than what scripture actually reveals. There are believers who don't look forward to heaven because their understanding of heaven is honestly something not worth looking forward to. Sometimes Christians can be guilty of envisioning almost a, a Hollywood style of heaven where we float around like angels with little halos, maybe in bleach bright robes, sitting on clouds of cotton balls, strumming tiny little harps for all of eternity. And that perception of heaven honestly doesn't sound very exciting. It leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, a version of heaven in which any sort of variety or color or vibrance or excitement, vitality is completely absent. But Hollywood cannot, it cannot define heaven for us. It must not. Centuries of monastic tradition does not define heaven for us. The only thing that defines heaven for us is God's word. God's word must be the standard and the scripture gives us a clear description of heaven and it is a description that is full of vibrancy and life. A description of heaven that is utterly glorious I think it's amazing to consider the fact that right now, this morning, Sunday, July 24th, 2022, the souls of those believers who have died are present with the Lord. They are gathered with him. They are surrounding his throne and they are singing praises to the Lamb just as is recorded in the fourth and fifth chapters of the book of Revelation. And if you read those chapters, you learn that heaven is anything but quiet or boring or colorless or dull. It is full of noise and exuberance and variety and excitement and joy as those from every tribe and tongue and nation and people gather to sing praise to their Savior. The truth is that the best that this life has to offer is nothing compared to what heaven will be. The best things in this life, the best food, the best memories, the best experiences, the best relationships, the best thrills, the best joys, they are but shadows. They are but shadows. Yesterday, our family had the opportunity to tour St. Paul's in London. And if you've been inside of St. Paul's, it is a breathtaking experience. We're not too proud as Americans to do the full-on tourist thing, so we've been doing some of those things while we've been here. And you walk into St. Paul's, and it's just, wow. Some might even describe it as a heavenly experience. 
But the reality is that even the greatest and most impressive structures that we can construct in this world are nothing compared to the size and magnificence that we will experience in the world to come. And so when we come to the book of Revelation, the final book in your Bible, we find the Apostle John giving us a glorious glimpse of our eternal home. Our eternal home, the heaven where believers will dwell with God for all of eternity. And unlike the Hollywood misrepresentation, the eternal heaven is in actuality a new heavens and a new earth, a new universe and a new world. And there the saints will live forever in their resurrected, glorified bodies, worshiping their Savior and serving Him with all joy and fulfillment and grace. So if you have your Bible this morning, I would invite you to take it and turn to the book of Revelation, actually to the end of the book of Revelation, to Revelation chapter 21, the second to last chapter in the scriptures. And we'll be spending time this morning in Revelation 21 verses 1 through 8. Now, I've titled this message this morning, What Heaven is Missing. What Heaven is Missing or What Heaven is Lacking. And that may sound like an odd title since my main intention this morning is actually to describe what heaven is like. But there's an interesting thing that the Apostle John does in introducing the new heavens and the new earth here in Revelation 21. He describes this amazing place, our future home. He describes it by differentiating it from all of the things in this world that make life on this earth so challenging and so difficult. In order to do that, John has to tell us as much about what is not there as what is. And you'll see that in this chapter, in addition to telling us things that will be part of the new heavens and the new earth, John spends a considerable amount of his descriptive effort in telling us what will not be there. In fact, these two chapters give us a host of realities, things that we experience now that will be absent from our experience in the world to come. Now, we're not going to spend time on all of these, but let me just read you a list here of some of these items that will be missing from heaven. In verse 1, we see that there's no sea. In verses 2 and 3, there's no longer any separation between God and man. In verse 4, there are no more tears or pain or death. In verse 5, there is nothing that will not be made new. In verse 6, there's no spiritual thirst that goes unquenched. In verse 8, no unredeemed sinner in heaven. Skipping down to verse 22, there's no temple because God is the temple. Verse 23, there's no need for the sun or the moon because God is the light. Also in verse 23, there's no need for a lamp. There's no night, verse 25. There's no closing of the gates, verse 25. There's nothing unclean and no one whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, verse 27. Chapter 22, verse 3, there is no curse. And verse 5 of chapter 22, there is no end to the service and the reign of Christ and the redeemed. The reign of Christ and the service of his people. Now again, we don't have time to go through every one of those elements in our message this morning. In fact, for our time together, I want to focus on five aspects of our present reality, our present experience that will be absent from our experience in heaven. 
five realities that we experience now that will be gone when we find ourselves in the new heavens and on the new earth. Now there are times in our own experience, of course, when the best way to describe something is by contrasting it with something that is familiar. Just to give you something of a limited illustration, when I was a university student, I purchased a used car. It was a small four-door compact car. It met my needs perfectly. It was cheap and relatively reliable. It was already seven years old when I purchased it. It had roughly 70,000 miles on it, but it ran well and I kept it for another 10 years. By the time I finally got rid of it, mainly because I didn't maintain it very well, it was in very bad shape. The engine still ran, but everything else about that car was entirely worn out. The suspension was broken, which meant any time I went over any sort of sizable bump, especially at speed, sometimes I would actually catch a little bit of air in my car. The air conditioning did not work, which being in Southern California was a big problem, something I think London experienced maybe earlier this week. The paint was peeling, the seats were ripped and scarred, the doors were scratched, one of the side mirrors had broken off and I had reattached it with duct tape. It was too old to have Bluetooth or even a CD player and the cassette player that was in there was broken. Both the front and back bumpers were damaged. At times the power steering would not work, which did not go well with the lack of air conditioning. And all that to say, the car was a total mess. Uh, in fact, I was told by some friends and even family members that I probably needed to get something different and stop embarrassing myself. I knew I couldn't sell it, so I finally took it to a scrapyard and said goodbye. Then I went out and I purchased a new car. The new car was also a small, four-door, compact car. In fact, it was made by the same manufacturer. But, in spite of the similarities, if you had asked me to describe my new car in those first few weeks after obtaining it, I probably would have spent as much time telling you what was not true about the new car in order to contrast it from the old one. There is no longer any trouble starting the engine. There are no more strange noises when I drive around. I am no longer embarrassed when I see people I know. Its paint is not peeling, its upholstery is not damaged, its mirrors have not fallen off. No longer do I have to deal with a faulty suspension, a damaged power steering system, or an air conditioner that only blows hot air in the summer. Those are all things that characterized my former car. But those things have passed away, <laughs> and all things have become new. The new is exponentially better than the old because the problems that characterize the old, they have disappeared. Now that illustration is obviously limited, but I think it gives you an idea of what the Apostle John is doing here as he introduces in detail the new earth, the eternal heaven, where you and I will spend forever and ever in the presence of Christ if we are in him this morning. So, let's look then at five characteristics of our present reality that will be absent from the world to come. Five realities we experience now that will be missing from heaven. What is heaven lacking? What is heaven missing? We can begin to answer that question by considering these five things. And the first of them is found in verse 1 
Whereas over 70% of our current planet is covered by ocean, the new earth will have no sea, and therefore it will have no sign of God's judgment. No sign of God's judgment. Look at what the Apostle John writes there in Revelation 21 verse 1. Then I saw, that actually occurs, that phrase, numerous times in the book of Revelation. It kind of introduces a new section. And here John is introducing the new heavens and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new universe and a new planet earth. For the first heaven and the first, uni the first earth had passed away. And then notice this. And the sea was no more. Now that's curious. Why would the Apostle John begin his description of the new earth by noting the fact that the ocean, the sea, is gone? And the sea is no more. Well, I think part of the answer to that question perhaps is found in the fact that the ocean covers nearly three quarters of our current planet. If you've seen photos from space, it's like the most obvious feature about our world is that it's blue. That would be a distinct thing to notice on John's part that it is absent. Not only that, but you may remember that the Apostle John, before he became a follower of Jesus, was a fisherman. And as a former fisherman, he would have taken a keen interest in the fact that there's no sea on this new earth. But I think there's more going on here than just the dramatic difference that no ocean would make on the physical appearance of our planet in part, I think the, the issue, the answer to why John begins with this is because he's highlighting the fact that the essence of life on the new earth revolves around a completely different cycle, not the hydrological cycle of evaporation and rain, but rather it revolves around the life of God seen in the river of life that flows from the throne of life and is surrounded by the tree of life. And you see all of that in the beginning part of Revelation 22. So the essence of life in the new earth is distinctly different. I think John is also making a doctrinal point. It seems that he is emphasizing that the new earth will not be characterized by the disorder and chaos that sometimes characterizes the sea. In fact, throughout the Bible, the sea is used as a metaphor sometimes for a principle of disorder and unrest. You see that in passages like Isaiah 57 verse 20, Psalm 107 verse 25 to 28, Ezekiel 28, 8. Those are passages where the sea represents almost a symbol of evil. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the beast comes out of the sea. And certainly in the new earth, there will no be any disorder, chaos, unrest, or evil. But I think there's something even more important that John is emphasizing here by making the point that the new earth has no sea. I believe what John is doing is he is emphasizing that there will be no sign of God's judgment on the new earth. And that's because the sea as we know it today is the result of God's judgment at the flood. Yes, it is true that God created the sea on day three of creation in Genesis 1 verse 10, but in Genesis chapter 7 verse 11, we see that something dramatic took place when water that was in the heavens came crashing down and water that was stored in the depths of the earth came bursting forth. The entire geography of our planet was changed by the flood. 
The mountains as we know them today are the result of the flood. The continents as we know them today are the result of the flood. In fact, we probably see continental drift hinted at in Genesis 10 verse 25. The fact that the oceans now encompass three quarters of our planet, it is the result of the flood. Even the rainbow, as beautiful as it is, is a result of the flood. A result of the massive atmospheric changes that took place on this planet when God's judgment fell. So without question, the flood was the greatest natural disaster that our world has ever experienced in its history or will ever experience until we get to the judgment that falls in the book of Revelation. Tidal waves that covered the entire world, earthquakes that split continents, volcanic eruptions out of which entire mountains were born and hurricanes that spanned the entire earth. I think maybe one of the most amazing things about the flood is to consider the death toll. Every human being on the planet, millions of people died in the flood with the exception of eight souls. And millions of animals killed with the exception of two of every kind. This was death on a scale like this world has never seen before or since. I do think it's a bit ironic how our world treats Noah and the flood. I can't speak for what happens here in the UK, but at least in America, Noah's animal-filled boat is found in greeting cards and comic strips and even baby decorations. But when we stop to consider the devastation that took place at the flood, the people who were drowned and the massive changes that took place to this earth, we begin to understand the gravity and the reality of it. So the sea though, the ocean, the sea as we know it today, it is the result of God's judgment on this earth. And the new earth will have no sign or symbol of God's judgment. I think that is the heart of John's point. Yes, a different, a different mode or essence of life. Yes, no evil or corruption or chaos or unrest. Yes, something that is physically very different about the new earth in terms of its appearance. But I think at the heart of it, why is the sea no more? Because there is no sign of God's judgment on the new earth. Well, that brings us to a second contrast that John brings to our attention. This is in verses 2 and 3. A second element that is missing from heaven. In verse 1, there's no sign of God's judgment. In verses 2 and 3, there will be no separation between God and man. No separation between God and man. Look at John as writing as he continues this description in verse 2, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. In verse 2, the Apostle John sees New Jerusalem, the capital city of the new earth, coming out of heaven and by implication being placed upon the new earth. And this is the dwelling place of the redeemed throughout all of redemptive history. Often throughout scripture, God uses the metaphor of a bride to describe his people. And here are his people 
pictured as a bride, and, and the picture emphasizes the beauty and the purity of the redeemed who have been cleansed from every defilement and purified, ready to be in fellowship with God forever. And then in verse 3, this most wonderful th truth. And this is, by the way, what makes the new earth heaven. The new earth is heaven, not because it's beautiful, not because it's amazing or spectacular or glorious, not because the angels are there, not because uh, dead saints are there. What makes heaven heaven is because God is there. It is his dwelling place, and he invites us to be in fellowship with him in his dwelling place for all of eternity. That is what makes heaven heaven. Well, in verse 1, we saw the great undoing of the flood. Here in verses 2 and 3, we see the great undoing of the fall. Because as you all know, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, mankind fell, and the human race has been fallen ever since, separated from God, outside of fellowship with him and here we have the undoing of the fall where man who was separated is now invited man who was cast out is now welcomed into the presence of God himself spending eternity in fellowship with the triune God is what makes heaven heaven it was Jonathan Edwards, the American Puritan, who said this, to go to heaven fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, children, the company of earthly friends, these are but shadows, but God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the ocean. I think that captures well the essence of the hope that's presented here in verses 2 and 3. As believers, there can be no greater joy, no greater anticipation than to be with God, to be with Christ. This is why Paul could exclaim to the Philippians in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain, because to die is to be in his presence. So Christ is what makes heaven heaven. His presence is what makes heaven glorious. And if we had time this morning to look at the entire chapter, we would see in verse 22 that there's not even a temple in the New Jerusalem because God himself is the temple. The temple represented in the Old Testament a place where those who had been separated from God could come and fellowship with him but only in specific terms but in heaven there is no temple because there is again no separation between God and man verses 23 and 24 the apostle John goes on to explain how the glorious presence of God will be the source of light for all who live on the new earth and then in chapter 22 verses 3 and 5 he explains how those who have the name of God written on their foreheads that's a reference to all the redeemed that our separation from God will be permanently removed so that we might serve him and worship him in face-to-face -face fellowship with him forever and ever. And this is the glorious reality of heaven that redeemed men and women might dwell in the presence of a holy God, not as enemies, but as citizens and servants and friends and children. Romans 8, 17, if we are in Christ, we are heirs of God through Christ. What a thought that we will worship him in perfect, joyful communion for all of eternity and he will be to us both our light and our life. The separation that has characterized humanity, the separation from God that has characterized the human race ever since Adam fell in the garden is gone. Well, that brings us to a third contrast. Verses 
a third element that will be missing from heaven. No sorrow or suffering, verses 4 and 5. No sorrow or suffering. John continues, he writes in verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Verse 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Verse 3 of chapter 22 John explicitly says that there will no longer be any curse, that the curse will be no more. He really gives us the practical outworking of that in these verses here in chapter 21. But again, we see in verse 1 that the flood has been undone, and in verses 2 and 3 that the fall has been undone. And here in verses 4 and 5 we see that the curse has been undone. The effects of the curse are removed. What a glorious thought. Because sin is no more, there is therefore no more sorrow or sickness or suffering or death. Contemplate that for a moment. You will never attend a funeral service in heaven you will never feel or experience the pain of loss. You will never require a bandage or a physician or medication. You will never become ill. You will never go to hospital. I always wanted to say that the British way. You will never go to the hospital. That's the American way. You will never have your heart broken. You will never experience the threat of persecution or the pain of rejection. These things have passed away, but he has made all things new. The paradise that was lost has been regained because in the same way that the first Adam fell through a tree, the second Adam has regained life through a tree so that we who entrust ourselves to him, trusting that his work on the cross has given us forgiveness because he paid the penalty and his resurrection vindicating that is our justification. Through him we receive his righteousness and we're clothed in his righteousness so that we who are unworthy are declared worthy and through faith in him, through no works of our own, we are given the hope expressed here. Was the hope of the curse undone for which the Apostle Paul groans in Romans chapter 8? What we suffer in this life under the weight of the curse is only temporary. One day we will no longer experience suffering or sorrow of any kind because the effects of the curse are gone. And so, in keeping with what 1 Thessalonians says, we do not grieve as the rest of the world that has no hope. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we can look at temporary light affliction as producing for us an eternal weight of glory. And we can consider it, as James says in James 1, joy when we encounter various trials, knowing that they are doing a work in us that is making us more like Christ. Now this perspective is possible because we look, one, we look forward to one day dwelling with the one who makes all things new. It is because the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, descended from heaven and experienced pain and suffering and sorrow and death that we who are in him look forward to the day when in his presence he will wipe every tear from our eyes.
Well, there's a fourth contrast in our list of five, a fourth a fourth reality that we experience in this earth that will be absent from the world to come. It's found in verses 6 and 7. And it is this, that there will be no spiritual thirst. And what I mean by that is no spiritual need that goes unmet. No aspect of our walk with God that is not wholly and completely fulfilled and satisfied in him. No spiritual thirst. Look at what John writes. Verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. You'll notice there in verse 6 that every spiritual thirst is satisfied, it is quenched with the free water of life. And every one of the redeemed will inherit the eternal promises that are given in this passage. All of this is promised from the God who is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. He alone can satisfy the spiritual thirst of his people. And he will do so as these verses promise. Throughout the scriptures, God portrays spiritual needs in terms of hunger and thirst. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, a familiar passage. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul thirsts for you, O God. Isaiah 55 verse 1, the call goes out, Everyone who thirsts, come to the water and drink without cost. In Matthew 5 verse 6, in the Beatitudes, our Lord himself said that those who hunger and thirst for true righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God, they are blessed. In John 4, he offered the water of eternal life to the woman at the well. And, and even in this passage... We see in Revelation 22, verse 17, Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. In John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, Jesus said it explicitly, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living Water. So the water in these passages represents, it symbolizes eternal life. What the scripture is saying, what our Lord is saying, is that those who want eternal life can find it freely and entirely and exclusively through our Lord Jesus. What is the essence of eternal life? According to John 17, verse 3, it is to know God and to know Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Eternal life is not just a quantity of life. It is a quality of life. It is to be in fellowship with God himself. It is to have your every spiritual need met perfectly by the only one who can meet them, the Lord Jesus, the God who created you. He alone can meet your every spiritual need. Need And for all of eternity, believers will never be spiritually hungry or thirsty because we will forever enjoy perfect fellowship with God himself. In verse 7, we learn that the promise of heaven belongs to the one who overcomes. This is a reference to those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. It is through him that they have overcome because the only way you can overcome the fact that you were dead in sin, blinded by sin, and enslaved to sin is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in him we have become overcomers, and in him we have been clothed in his righteousness, and in him then we are given an inheritance, and that inheritance is our hope, and that hope is described for us in this passage. And our hope will not disappoint because your hope is only as good as the one who promises and God never disappoints. 
what a thought that for those who have trusted fully in Christ on the day described in this passage, our faith will be sight, our hope will be realized, and our love will be complete. The 5th century theologian Augustine, he said this in his confessions, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you, O Lord. I think that's absolutely true. And heaven is a place of perfect rest because in his presence, we will never experience any spiritual lack or longing. They will all be perfectly met in him. Well, in verse 1, we saw the undoing of the flood. In verses 2 and 3, we saw the undoing of the fall. In verses 4 and 5, we see that the curse is also undone. And here in verses 6 and 7, we see that even the effects of our sinful human flesh are undone. Every spiritual thirst is met. Every spiritual weakness is gone. Every sin, every, every weakness covered. Every longing, every need fulfilled. That which distract us, removed. That which trips us up, taken away. Our flesh will be undone. For all of eternity, we will experience true life in its deepest and most profound sense because we will be in fellowship with God himself, the very giver of life and the very definition of eternal life. So what is heaven missing? Well, there's no sign of divine judgment, verse 1. No separation from God, verses 2 and 3. No sorrow or suffering, verses 4 and 5. No spiritual thirst that goes unmet, verses 6 and 7. Which brings us to a fifth and final element that will be absent from the world to come. I've described it this way. There will be no sanctuary for sinners there. No sanctuary for unredeemed sinners. The Apostle John is clear that only those who have become heirs of God, only those who have had their sins forgiven because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, only those who have been clothed in his justifying righteousness, only those who have placed their faith savingly in him, only those who long to see him and look forward to that day, only the redeemed experience the joys of heaven. In verse 8, John draws the contrast, noting that no unsaved sinner, no unredeemed person will ever set foot on the new earth, and that's because the new earth is no sanctuary for sinners. Look at verse 8, John writes, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We see this truth repeated at the end of chapter 1. Verses 25 to 27, the Apostle John emphasizes that no one whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life will enter the new Jerusalem. And of course, we live in a world and in an age in which pretty much everyone thinks pretty much everyone is going to heaven. But nothing could be further from the truth. Heaven is only for those who have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith. What did our Lord say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Those whose sins have not been forgiven through Christ will not inherit the joys of heaven. Verse 8 makes this clear. They will find no refuge there. Instead, they will be sent into eternal judgment judgment. 
And that's a sobering thought to consider. And some of you may perhaps be looking at that list there in Revelation 21 verse 8. And you may be thinking, well, some of those things describe my own life. Or at least my life at some point in the past. The truth is, we are all guilty before God's law. At one time, we were all unbelieving. We were all idolaters. We were all guilty of sins like lying and cowardice. But therein lies the heart and the beauty of the gospel. Because we all deserve the lake of fire. None of us deserve entry to the new earth. And it is not until we recognize our unworthiness that we can cry out to God for mercy and cast ourselves entirely on Christ. I think it's interesting if we compare this list in verse 8 of Revelation 21 with the list in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 to 11 we see some striking parallels listen as i read that passage paul said do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor the effeminate nor homosexuals nor thieves nor the covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God then he says such were some of you but you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God And Paul's point in that passage is that, yes, these characteristics characterized us because we were part of fallen, unredeemed humanity, and yet God in his grace reached down through the gospel and he regenerated us through his spirit so that we might embrace his son in saving faith and then clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we look forward to the day when we will be welcomed into heaven, not on the basis of our deeds, but on the basis of his merit. Those who are clothed in his righteousness look forward to true sanctuary, But those who have not embraced him in saving faith, having never had their sins paid for at the cross, they will be cast into eternal judgment to pay the punishment they rightly deserve. I can't help but thinking of the words of the Puritan Richard Baxter, who he was about to die, thought he was about to die. He actually lived quite a bit longer, but he got sick and thought he was about to die. And what do you do if you think you're about to die and you're a Puritan? You write a book. And so Richard Baxter wrote a book called The Saints Everlasting Rest about the hope of heaven. And in that book, he talks about how on the floor of heaven, you should stamp the word deserved. But above the gate, excuse me, I said that wrong. I'm going to blame that on jet lag. On the floor of hell, you should write the word deserved because hell is what we all deserve. But on the gates of heaven, write the words, the free gift. When we think about heaven, we come to appreciate it so much more if we consider the distance between what we deserve and what we will receive. Verse 8 is what we deserve. Verses 1 to 7 is what we will receive if we are in Christ. Because the passage to the lake of fire reads deserved. But the passageway to the new earth reads the free gift. The difference between what we deserve and what we receive is infinite. 
What we deserve, we will not receive. What we receive, we do not deserve. And all of it is possible because of what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on our behalf. For those who do not know the Lord, Revelation 21 verse 8 presents a sober warning. In keeping with our theme for this morning, what heaven is missing, my urge to you this morning is... Don't let heaven be missing you. And don't you be missing from heaven. For those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation 21 verse 8 presents an incredible picture of the gospel. Because it reminds us of what we deserve based on our works and what we receive based on the work of our substitute and our savior. So in verse one, we saw that the flood was undone. In verses two and three, the fall is undone. Verses four and five, the curse will be undone. Verses six and seven, our sinful flesh and weakness will be undone. And verse eight, we're reminded that for believers, our condemnation is undone. Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our punishment is undone. Our wages are undone. Hell itself is undone for those who are in Christ. Well, if we had more time this morning, we could continue by talking about the new Jerusalem, which the Apostle John goes on to describe in verses 9 through the end of the chapter, really all the way through chapter 22, verse 5. But in this message, we've limited our focus to the first eight verses of chapter 21. And in those verses, we've seen five realities of this present world that will be absent from the world to come. Five things Heaven is missing. Verse 1, there is no sign of God's judgment. Verses 2 and 3, no separation from God. No separation between God and man. Verses 4 and 5, no sorrow or suffering. Verses 6 and 7, no spiritual thirst that will be unmet. And verse 8, no sanctuary for sinners except through Jesus Christ. And it is through him that the sanctuary described in this text is offered to you. We can rejoice that these things will be missing from heaven. We can rejoice that these things will be absent. In fact, this is part of what makes our hope so hopeful. That these things that make this present life so difficult will be removed from the life to come. I want to close this morning with an illustration that I came across actually just a couple of years ago. There was a British pastor in the early 1900s. His name was John Harper. And John Harper, along with his sister and his daughter. His wife had died a number of years earlier. He was a, a widower. He and his young daughter, along with his sister, were making passage across the Atlantic. John Harper had been invited to come and preach in the church that D.L. Moody had founded. This is in the year 1912, April of 1912. The ship that John Harper embarked on is a very famous ship, maybe more infamous than famous. It's the Titanic. Now you may or may not know this, but there was an evangelical, very faithful pastor aboard the Titanic, and he was there on April 14th into the early morning hours of April 15th, when the Titanic sank. And I think about that story in connection to what we've talked about today because we live in a world that is kind of like the Titanic. It's going down. The ship is going down. 
And my question is, for you who know and love the Lord Jesus, what would you do if you had been John Harper on April 14th, 1912, when the Titanic struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and began to sink? Well, I'll tell you what he did, because it's an amazing story. He helped his sister and his daughter get onto the lifeboats. And then, instead of joining them, he turned back to the ship. And he spent the remaining hours of his earthly sojourn pleading with everyone he came in contact with in the midst of the panic that they would turn to Christ. In fact, the text that he was using was from Acts 16, where Paul told the Philippian jailer, when the jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? Paul's response was, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. At one point, he was urging a man to give his life to Christ and the man wanted nothing to do with it, even in the face of a sinking ship. John Harper took off his life vest and gave it to the man and said to him, you will need this more than I do. According to some of the survivors of the Titanic, they said even after the ship submerged under the, the waters of the North Atlantic, John Harper was swimming from piece of wreckage to piece of floating wreckage, urging the people who were clinging on for dear life to give their hearts to Jesus. Four years after the Titanic incident, there was a reunion of Titanic survivors in Canada, and there was a man there who said that he was one of those clinging for his life to a piece of floating wreckage when John Harper came up to him, swimming up to him in those icy waters, and urged him to turn to Christ. He said, at first I was resistant, but then I was overwhelmed by the the work of the Spirit, and I gave my life to Christ. And he told those others gathered there at that reunion, I am the last convert of John Harper. What a cool story. And of course, as John Harper, swimming into the distance, never to be heard from again in this life, slipped beneath those waters giving way to hypothermia and entering from panic into paradise to hear his Savior say to him, well done. But what an example for us, those of us who have the hope of heaven and we see those perishing around us. May we take the hope of the gospel to them urging them to find sanctuary in the only one who can give them this hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the truth of the gospel, that through your Son, the Lord Jesus, we who do not deserve anything but hell and punishment might receive through him eternal life that we might be in fellowship with you even this day and we do look forward to the day when that fellowship will be face to face as we join with all of the redeemed throughout all of history singing praises to the lamb it's in his name that we pray these things today. Amen.